Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Flink Forward, brought to you by Data Artisans. Hi, this is George Gilbert. We are at Flink Forward on the ground in San Francisco. This is the user conference for the Apache Flink community. It's the second one in the US. And this is sponsored by Data Artisans. We have with us Greg Benson, who's chief scientist at SnapLogic and also professor of computer science at University of San Francisco. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for having me. Good to, good to have you. So, um, Greg, tell us a little bit about um, how SnapLogic currently uh, sets up its, well, how it builds its technology to connect different applications, and then talk about a little bit what you're, where you're headed and what you're trying to do. Sure, sure. So, so SnapLogic is a, it's a, a data and app integration uh, cloud platform. We provide a graphical interface that lets you drag and drop components that we call snaps, and you kind of put them together like Lego pieces uh, to define uh, relatively sophisticated uh, tasks uh, so that you don't have to write uh, Java code. Uh, we use machine learning to help you uh, build out these pipelines quickly so we can anticipate based on your data sources what you are going to need next, and uh, that let, let lends itself to building uh, rapid building of these uh, pipelines. Uh, we have a couple of different ways to execute these pipelines. You can think of it as sort of this specification of what the pipeline is supposed to do. We have a proprietary engine that we can execute on single nodes, uh, either in the cloud or behind your firewall in your data center. Uh, we also have a mode which can translate these pipelines into Spark code and then execute those pipelines at scale. So you, you can do, um, you can do sort of small, low latency processing to uh, sort of larger batch processing on, on you know, very large data sets. Okay, and so you were telling me before that you're evaluating Flink or doing research with Flink as another option. Tell us what use cases that would address that the first two don't. Yeah, good, good question. Um, I'll just back up a little bit. So, uh, because I have this dual role of chief scientist and as a professor of computer science, um, I'm able to get graduate students to work on research projects um, for, for credit and then eventually as interns at, at SnapLogic. A recent project that we've been working on since we started last fall, so working on about six or seven months now, is investigating Flink as a possible new backend for uh, the SnapLogic platform. So uh, this allows us to, you know, to explore and prototype um, and just sort of you know, figure out if there's going to be a good match between an emerging technology and, and our platform. So, um, yeah. but go back to your question, yeah. Uh, yeah. what would this address? Well, so uh, without going into too much of the technical differences between Flink and Spark, which I imagine has come up in some of your conversations or it comes up here because um, they, they can solve similar use cases, um, our experience with, with Flink is the code base has been quite easy to work with, uh, both, from an, it, both from sort of taking our specification of pipelines and then converting them into uh, Flink code that can run. But there's another benefit that we see from Flink, and that is whenever you're, any product, whether it's our product or anybody else's product that uses something like Spark or Flink as a backend, um, there's this challenge because you're converting something that your users understand into this target, right? This Spark API code or Flink API code. And the challenge there is if something doesn't go, something goes wrong, how do you, how do you propagate that back to the user so the user doesn't have to you know, read log files or you know, get into the nuts and bolts of how Spark really works? And, and it's, what, almost like, uh, it's almost like you've compiled it, you've compiled the code and now, if something doesn't work right, you need to work at the source level. That's, that's exactly right. And that's what we don't want our users to do, right? right. So one, one promising thing about Flink is that um, we're, we're able to integrate the code base in such a way that we have a better understanding of what's happening and the failure conditions that occur. And we're working on ways to propagate those back to the users so they can take actionable steps to remedy those without having to understand the Flink API code itself. And what is it then about Flink um, or its API that gives you that um, feedback about errors or um, you know, operational status that gives you, you know, 
better visibility than you would get in uh, something else like Spark. Yeah, so I'll, without getting too, too deep on the, on the, on the subject, what we have found is um, one thing nice about the Flink code base is uh, the core is written in Scala, but there's a lot of um, all the I/O and memory handling is written in Java, and that's uh, and that's where we need to do our primary interfacing and the building blocks, sort of the core building blocks uh, to get to, for example, um, something that you build with a data set API to execution. Um, it's we have found it easier to follow the transformation steps that Flink takes to end up with a resulting sort of optimized uh, optimized uh, Flink pipeline. Now, uh, the, so, the, so by understanding that transformation, like you were saying, the compilation step, by understanding it, then we can work backwards and understand how, how when something happens, how to trace it back to what the user was originally trying to the specify. GUI, the GUI yeah. specification. Right. So uh, help, help me understand though, um, it sounds like you're the one essentially building a compile, compiler from a graphical specification language down to Spark as the you know, su sort of pseudo, you know, pseudo compile code or, yep. or Flink. And, but if you're the one doing that yep. compilation, I'm, I'm still struggling yeah. to understand why, so, why, why you would have better reverse engineering capabilities just, with one. It just, it just, it, it just is a matter of um, getting visibility into the steps that the underlying frameworks are taking. Oh. And so we have, um, I'm not saying this is impossible to do in Spark, but we have found uh, that we've had, bet it's been easier for us to get into the tran transformational steps that Flink is taking. Almost like, like for someone who's had as much programming as a one semester in night school, <laughs> like a, a variable inspector that's already there. Yeah, that's good, there you go, yeah. yeah okay, yeah, yeah. so you don't have to go try and, you can't actually add it, and you don't have to then infer it from the lo all this log data. Now, I should add, there's, an, there's another potential Flink. You were asking about use cases and what does Flink address. Yeah. As you know, uh, uh, Flink is a streaming platform and in addition to being a batch platform. And uh, Flink does streaming differently than how Spark does. Spark takes a micro-batch approach. What, what we're also looking at in my research effort is uh, how to take advantage of Flink's streaming approach to um, allow the SnapLogic GUI to be used to specify streaming Flink applications. Initially, we're just focused on the batch mode, but now we're also looking at the potential to convert these graphical pipelines into streaming Flink applications, which would be a great benefit to uh, customers who real time want, want, to do, want to do what everybody's, what all Alibaba and all the other companies are doing but you know, take advantage of it without having to get into the nuts and bolts of the programming. Do it through, through the GUI. Wow, oh, so, so it's almost like, it's like Flink beam in terms of abstraction layers, sure. and then snap logic. Sure, yes. Not that you would compile the beam, but, right, right. but the idea that you would have per event processing and a real-time real pipeline. Yes. Okay, so that's actually interesting. So that would open up a whole new Set of capabilities. Yeah, and it and it and you know it it, it follows our uh, you know company's vision in 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 allowing uh, lots of users to do very sophisticated things without being you know uh, Hadoop developers or Spark developers or even Flink developers. Um, we we do a lot of the hard work of of trying to give you a representation that's easier to work with, right? Yeah. Um, but also allow you to sort of evolve that and debug it and also eventually get the performance out of these systems. The, one of the challenge, of course, with Spark and Flink is they, they have to be tuned and you know, you, 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 you have to, and so what we're trying to do is um, using some of our machine learning is eventually gather information that can help us identify how to tune different types of workflows in different environments. And that, you know, if we were able to do that in its entirety, then we, you know, we take out a lot of the really hard work that goes into making a lot of these streaming applications um, both scalable um, and performant. Performant. So this would be, but you would have to, to do that, you would probably have to uh, collect um, um, upper, upper, well, what's the term? Uh, 
I guess, data from the operations of many customers. Right. Because you, you, as training data, just as the developer alone, you won't really have enough. I, I, absolutely, and that's, so that you have to, you have to bootstrap that. Uh, we, we've, for our um, machine learning that we currently use today, we leverage you know, the, the thousands of pipelines, the trillions of documents that we now process on a monthly basis, and that allows us to provide good recommendations when you're building pipelines because we have a lot of information. Oh, so you, you are serving the runtime, um, the run, these runtime compilations. Yes. Oh, they're, they're not all, they're not hosted on the customer premises. Oh, no, 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 they, they, we, we do both. So it's oh. interesting, we do both. So yeah. you, can, you can deploy completely in the cloud. We, we're a complete SaaS provider for you. Yeah. Most of our customers though, um, you know, banks, healthcare, want to run, our engine behind their firewalls. Even when we do that though, we still have metadata that we can get introspection, sort of anonymized, but we can get introspection into how things are behaving. Okay, so. that's very interesting. All right, Greg, we're going to have to end it on that note, but uh, I, you know, I guess everyone stay tuned. That sounds like a, a big step forward in sort of specification of real-time pipelines at a, a graphical level. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I hope to be talking to you again soon with, with more results. Uh, looking forward to it. With that, uh, this is George Gilbert. We are at uh, Flink Forward, the user conference for the Apache Flink conference, uh, I'm sorry, for the Apache Flink, Flink user community and sponsored by Data Artisans. We will be back shortly. <laughs> <laughs>